I guess we've reached the beginning of the end. <laughs> cool. So I'll be talking about magnifying glasses. I work at Etsy, which is a marketplace for handmade items. We have over a million shops, and you can find almost anything. And my name is Jason, and you can tweet at me. Cool. So I think this is kind of overused, but I really believe we're that guy building something way too big than we're ready to do when we do web development. We have a lot of new technologies. We're constantly working on our tools. We're constantly making them better. But our ambitions far outreach what we're really capable of doing today in a safe manner. So I'm going to be talking about one piece of that pie, and that will be browser tools, specifically around the Chrome Dev tools and some things I've been thinking about. But that really extends to all the things we've talked about today, from like GIS to React to just all the excitement things. I began really thinking about tooling when I went to hacker school two years ago and was exposed to tons of ideas. I worked on REPLs. I fell in love with the idea of the REPL, exploring the language and the application. I specifically worked on Pry for two months, and I loved it. I realized you can do so much if you have access to that. I was exposed to Brett Victor and the idea of inventing on principle and interactive systems and saw a light table come about with Chris Granger, and I'm really excited about what he's doing. And then I was exposed to ideas like Smalltalk, programming languages that aren't even used right now but ran in a system where you can query the runtime for the classes and all the instances of the classes, and I thought that was like the coolest thing. And then I started working in the browser and realized all these things could come together with the Chrome DevTools or really any dev tool in the browser. So tooling is awesome. Some of the main takeaways that I had while working on Pry and thinking about these things were that tools really just extract data out of structure. The reason why Pry works is that we can get data out of Ruby. We can get way more data out of Ruby than we can JavaScript. <laughs> the reason why we can get data out of Backbone is there's a structure to how Backbone is set up, and we can extract that data. I also began realizing that tools are just code. As developers, we're really good at writing code and really good at using tools, but we often don't connect the dots and realize we can hack on our tools as well. As an example of that, when people use REPLs, they're used to like, typing into the terminal and getting something out. But they don't really think about where the REPL came from. It's really just a loop that reads something in, evaluates it, and prints it. The whole idea of a REPL can be expressed in four lines. Tools must fit a workflow. I saw tons of tools that were just technology, and they were cool. But you never used them, you forgot about them, and they just died. So when I began thinking about tools, I realized they had to fit a workflow. They had to be useful. They can be powerful, and also some people just will never use them. Some of the best engineers don't use tools as much as I do, and that's OK. Maybe you don't as well. A lot of engineers just print, and that's fine, and they'll deduce, and they'll think about it, and that works. Today I'll be talking about tools, and if you aren't super into dev tools, that's fine. But I'll just show you kind of the world as I see it. Now, how do we build an inspector for your application? Well, the first thing is that it's going to be different than the inspectors for the DOM and just JavaScript. You want a higher level. So our inspector is just like the elements pane and the sources pane. But we're going to make meaning out of the view layer, the model layer, and the events layer. The second thing is we're going to focus on exploring the application in the same way that you can use the magnifying glass to search the page and find the DOM. We're going to explore your application. The second is we're going to tightly integrate a feedback loop. So as we write code and see it running the browser, a lot of things happen. We don't see the effect of that. But Brett Victor and a lot of people began looking at the effect of a feedback loop, the effect of console logging, for example, to tighten that. And what they realized is that ideas can come to fruition much, much faster if we tighten that feedback loop. So maybe our tools can show you the effect of showing a view, setting up the events, shutting it down, and taking them away. And just you can validate that everything worked the way it should. Lastly, as we build more ambitious applications, the inspector ought to help us communicate. We have larger teams. Development is a team sport. It's not an individual endeavor. As engineers, we're working with product managers and designers. And it's important that these tools help us communicate what's happening under the scene so that we can all understand it. Maybe the inspector can help us understand the application in a way that just reading the code doesn't. Maybe as engineers, we've been focusing so much on great APIs and great code 
that we've ignored that there are other ways of understanding the application, maybe more visual ways. So this inspector hopes to help you communicate what's going on. And I've got some demos. This talk is primarily demos. <laughs> um, and we are nearing the end. So if you have any questions, if something doesn't make sense, just shout it. Honestly, I've got 40 minutes, and it'd be a lot of fun to share with you. If any of these demos are cool, any of the things happening in the Spectre like, surprise you, and you're not sure how it works, just shout. Let me know. All right. So the first app I'm going to show is Marinette Wires. Actually, before I start, how many people use Marinette? Just curious. Show of hands. Like, actively? Whoa. That's great. I did not expect that. I thought, like, you, you, you. I know you guys use it. <laughs> cool. Um, Marinette is just a set of view functions, view classes, and other utilities architecture that you can use. And I'll kind of point out what's different about Marinette. This is a Marinette inspector, but like 80% of its backbone. So it's cool. We've got this first app, which is called Marinette Wires. It was written by James Kyle. That dude right there, he's awesome. He put tons of stuff in it, put some great design into it. And if you're interested in how to build a great Marinette app, I highly recommend downloading and play with it. So it's got a colors app, basic crud stuff, a books app, and that kind of thing. And I could show you the code, but it would take a really long time to understand it. So instead, I'm just going to open the inspector. By the way, you can download the Marinette Inspector from the Chrome Web Store, and it will show up right here. Cool. So the first thing you see when the inspector opens up is a representation of the application. So I can hover over the header, content, and overlay. If I open up the content, I see that this is really just a layout with a library and a viewer. So this is the first thing that Marinette offers, and probably the biggest thing that Marinette offers that help you build your backbone apps. James pointed this out yesterday, but Marinette offers a layout and a collection. And it's not just that it's easier to do layouts and lists, it's that we have structure for how to represent the layouts. So with the inspector, I can show you that there's a layout that has a header, flashes, and content. And in fact, content's just another layout with a library and a viewer. And if I want to see what this layout is like or this library is like, all I have to do is open up the library and I see there are a bunch of items. So the inspector is pulling this data out of the application and showing it to you. And I think this is really cool because as our app gets bigger, it's harder to associate what you see on the page with what's running in the application. All I have to do is click right here and it shows me this view. So that's the magnifying glass. Once we have a view selected, we can see what's going into it. So is this big enough? Can you read this thing? Yeah. Oh man, I love this projector. <laughs> this is awesome. So every view obviously has an element, and you can see that right here. It also has a CID, tag name, those kind of things. Um, one thing you might not be familiar with, because you don't open it up that often, is that views often have listeners. And with this pane, we can see all the listeners that are going in as well. And this is kind of cool. Remember how we're showing an item here from a collection? we can see that this collection view is listening to those events. And that's just something that Marinette offers. And we're just asso associating these views with other views so you can get an idea of how they're connected. Now, as I move around, I can jump to the Books app as well, actually the Colors app, and it's just going to update for us. I can click around, and it's all just there. One thing I was thinking about while working on this is how this header was constructed. So I looked inside here, and I opened up the class properties. Now, you should know that one thing Marinette does, like actually, the only thing Marinette does, really, is extend backbone classes. So we have backbone view here, and backbone view is subclassed by Marinette view, which is subclassed by item view in this case, and then subclassed again for the header. So. When I mouse right here, I'm looking at the template helper function that we wrote, that James wrote for this header. And template helpers is just a function that Marinette offers to get some extra data to pump into the template. So what I want to do is look at this header and see how it was constructed, what data went into it, and what the template is doing under the hood. So the first thing I'm going to do is jump on template helpers so I can see the data. Sorry, I'm also going to set 
uh, an alarm so I know how long I'm going. Cool. All right, so clicking on template helpers is going to open the source pane and show us that function. And by the way, this is my favorite feature because now I don't have to understand where all the source is coming from. Like, this is a big project, but my app that I work on professionally is way, way bigger. And finding a function, any function in a view in a file is kind of difficult, even if I wrote it myself. So I really love that the inspector can hyperlink between the view I'm looking on the page, that instance, its underlying functionality, and the source pane. So here's the template helpers. And we see that there's a primary items variable. This is going to be really important. And when I jump to the template, by the way, I know that the template's right here because I see he's re James is requiring it in this folder. When we jump to the template, there's an li for each primary item. And that's what becomes these links. Let me show you. So we have a breakpoint here. When I refresh, doo -doo 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 -doo, we can compute the value of these primary items. And I have a little watch expression to do that. The first render, there aren't any primary items. The second one, uh, there is one primary item. And the second time, there are two, which is kind of weird that this view is being rendered multiple times. But I'm cool with that. And we see that the name is colors, and there's some data as well. I'm going to release this breakpoint, allow it to continue. And then when I jump back to Marionette, I want to see how often this view was really rendered. Because I think it's weird. And sometimes you get in these cases where a view is being rendered too many times, and you don't even know it. Like, often it doesn't really matter because it's so fast. But it's a weird behavior of the application. And it could cause some bugs down the road. So go into the header. I can look at this activity pane. And the activity pane has collected all the events that were emitted from the view, which is super useful if you want to see how often something was rendered. In Marionette, we capture a lot of events, the whole life cycle, by emitting events like before render and render for each view. And we see this is crazy. Like, look how many times this view was rendered just on the initial page load. It's, it's OK. It's fast. But it was unexpected and could cause bugs down the road. So the inspector helps us see that. And it also shows a warnings pane saying, like, hey, dude, this was a little aggressive. <laughs> so if you're in a scenario where you're looking for like, what could be going on, you can check out the warnings pane. And we have a lot of warnings coming. Things like maybe the render took too long. Like the, it took 100 milliseconds, and that could be a problem. Hey, um, we have filters over the events. Oh, sorry. The question was, how do we define our warnings? And the answer is that we parse the events, and we have some rules. Like this rule basically says we're two events or two renders happening in quick succession. So at least two renders happen within 10 milliseconds. In this case, there were 10 renders all within 10 milliseconds. So that's no good. We have another one if like, the duration of the event is like 100 milliseconds. That's pretty bad, and we'll like, point that out as well. Uh, yeah, and you can configure them yourself. That brings me to the activity pane. I think this is, this is really cool. I think you're going to like this. So remember how we clicked around a bunch of times? Well, that resulted in a lot of actions. We have this idea with the inspector that events that happen in quick succession are an action. So when the application starts, a lot of things happen. And because they happen in quick succession, that's one action. When I open, let's say, that book or that book app, that's another action. Just clicking resolves some actions or some events, which is an action. And because events can be nested, because events are synchronous, one event can start before another one finishes. We have this idea of depth. So this is all the things that happened for the application to load. We just kept rendering and rendering and rendering and rendering. And I can see what was being rendered at each point. This is a show event. This is us showing the header. This show is the layout view, which was destroyed at some point. Composite view, probably also destroyed. There's that blue-violet thing being rendered. And because we capture this whole life cycle and allow you to look at it after the fact, you can find some really evil things going on here. Like maybe there's that render thing, or maybe there's like crazy, crazy things you're doing that are hard to surface if you didn't have this. Because we now have this tree of events 
and actions, I'm thinking we can explore this a lot more. Maybe add some watch expressions. And that's the activity pane for wires. All right, so I'm going to quickly jump to the other two examples, and maybe we can circle back. So the second example is an app called Gistbook that uh, Bokur, James Smith over there, has been working on for a long time. And the idea of Gistbook is that as he writes about code and as he hopes we'll write about code, we can tell kind of a narrative, kind of a story, in maybe an IPython notebook way about what we're thinking. So in this case, this is a simple story about calculating the norm of a vector in JavaScript. It's kind of geeky. And there's some JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. Hey, James, how do I edit this? Nice. I knew something was going to go wrong. Cool. So I have an anonymous one that I can edit. The way you build these books, you can just write some HTML here, do 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 do, hit run, and it'll be run. Some JavaScript here, two plus two. If I want to move a section around, I just have to pick it up, drag it. I can add a new section. It's kind of like a fun environment for writing stuff. And it's all written in Marinette, so I can show you how it works. And once again, I can show you the code, but it would take longer to look at the code than it would just to play around with it with the inspector. So let's see here. I'm just wondering why this is empty. It's because we have no Wi-Fi. Hmm. Nice. Okay, so the problem is, yeah. Can I tether? Just come over here. Thanks, by the way. Sure thing. Cool. Yeah, I think this app is way more exciting. So right away, we can see that the way a gist book is constructed, there's a sections container with each section being its own view, and a view having a wrapper with content. So you just get a sense of the hierarchy of the views. And the other thing you see is that a section has a header and an output, which is showing things. And the gist book container is probably just a layout. Now. What I want to do is drill into how he edits his header. So notice when I hit save, it just closes, I hit edit, it opens, this kind of thing. And I think there are a lot of patterns for this kind of behavior. But effectively, what we're doing here is showing either the header as a view or the form as a view. And we're just inserting views into a region. When I looked for the code, it was kind of hard to understand how this was working. So I just opened it up in the inspector, clicked on the form, saw the header, and was beginning to play. With the header, I can see that there are a couple triggers. I can actually see that there's some UI. So there's an edit title. And trigger is a Marinette constant that says, basically, when there's this event clicking on the edit title, we're going to emit uh, an event called edit. So we're transforming a DOM event into a business event. Now, because we've emitted event, we have to find who's listening to it. The first guy who could be listening to is the view itself. And if it is, there's a method like on edit in here, or another listener. There isn't one. So we have to see who else is listening to the edit event, who else wired it up. And that's really easy with the inspector. All we have to do is look at the listeners, find the edit event, and we know that layout view, this whole gist book, is listening to the edit event. It's just like that. And if I want to see who's handling that event, I just click right here, and I'm taken to the show edit title function. Now, if you don't believe me, I'm just going to set a breakpoint, hit edit, and we're there, like that. Now, how does this work? This works by creating a view and shoving it into the region, and that's just the top two lines. 
there's also this other line where it sets up a listener so that if cancel or save or fired, another function's called. And that brings us to this different view. I'm going to do the same thing. And this time, there's a form, save, cancel, and then triggers like on save and on cancel. We can look at the listeners and see that the just book is also listening to save and cancel, and our class is listening to on save. So save is being handled by two guys, both the edit form and the just book. Looking at on save, we see that all it does is get the new title value and save it. That's cool. And then looking at the listeners again, we can jump to this method, which is the layout listening to the save event. And we see that because we're done, we can render the header view again and show it and go back to the original state. And it's just like that. We can begin playing with any part of just book, see how anything works, and it's all just kind of like explorable. And that's just book. OK, so this is the Etsy app. And I wanted to show this example because, A, I've been working on this for the past year along with a really great team at Etsy, and I'm really excited about it. And B, because it's a larger app, like this is something that probably looks closer to what y'all are working on back at your jobs. Um, so this app helps shops manage their inventory. And as we were thinking about it last year, we wanted to go away from a server-side app to something client-side so we had much, much richer interactions. It's great for browsing. We have a visual mode, a list mode. It's great for editing. I can, let's say I want to edit this guy. Click in here. Drill into anything. It's all kind of explorable. I can select a bunch of items doo -doo -doo, and say renew, that kind of thing. Or just edit that guy. So this app does a lot. There's a lot to it. Let's see how it looks in the inspector. So the first thing to notice is that even though it's doing a lot, in many ways it's just like Marinette Wires. We designed the app so that we have one shop app and then many sub apps like inventory, stats, and orders, just like the Wires app has colors and books. So we have one app, uh, one layout, with a header and a page region. And we can open up this page region and play around with it. So there's a header, body. Body has a list with table rows. And these views are just like other views, except it's just so much more in it. We see, first of all, that like a row is a layout view, a Marinette layout view, which extends that with listing and then table row. And there's all this functionality. The next pattern I want to show you uh, would be how we change modes, how we go from this table view to the visual view. Because I just think it's a cool pattern. So there's a display type button. And when I click it, there's an on button click event. And then that just changes a model. So we use this idea of like view state. And our view model has something like display type, which can either be like list or grid. And clicking it just changes it, which is cool. But when that model changes its value, what happens? If I want to figure that out, all I have to do is look at the model that's under this view, click on it, and I can see who else is listening to the display type value and might adjust. I think this is so cool. By the way, you have all these stats things, like all these views are listening to the stats value. And then there are three guys listening to the display type value. The display type button, and then this list view. And that tells us what's going to happen. When I click on this grid view, the list view sees that and knows we want to toggle from table to grid. It's just a way of connecting from a view to a model to another view. The next thing I want to show you is how our buttons work to show overlays or dropdowns. 
And I think this is something that more people in the Marionette community are doing. I'm just going to find this link here. Come on. Yep, so that's the filter button. When I click it, it takes us to OnClick. And we have this event bus in Marinette called Radio that's been worked on a lot. And what Radio is doing here, well, first of all, we create a new filter overlay. What Radio is doing is saying, take this filter overlay, make it data, and ship that data over to the application uh, and tell it to show the overlay. So we have an app channel and then this overlay show event. So who's responsible for showing an overlay and where does that happen? Fortunately, we have a radio tab. And when I show you this radio tab, it's gonna look really extreme, but you'll see what's going on. We use radio throughout this app to do tons and tons of things. For example, we're often commanding the application to do things, and when we do that, we send that over the application channel. So I'm gonna open up this channel and you can see a ton of events, and then we can look at that. Okay, there's a lot of stuff here. If we drill down to overlay show, we'll see what we're looking for, and that is when there's an overlay show command, this behavior over here is going to handle that. We also might command the application to navigate, show a message, start progress, stop progress, tons and tons of things. Let's just quickly look at what happens with the overlay and then we can jump back to the application. So showing an overlay is as easy as shipping the view up and then showing it in this region. I click on this button, we can look at this pop-up it's just a view being shown in a region. So in fact, it's really simple. Now, here's everything coming together. When I click on this renew action, it's gonna show a renew action. This is the same action for a listing as it would be for bulk edit. So how does that work? Well, to figure it out, because I don't really remember, <laughs> I'm gonna jump to this Renew button, and then we're gonna see all the handlers and follow the code through, through the pipeline. Hmm. All right, cool. So this is part of a button group called, what's that called, State Transition Actions. I don't even think I wrote this code, so this is kind of an adventure for me too. And when I click on one of these buttons, there's this handler like on click state. Yeah, probably just on click state is what we want. And it takes us here. So I'm just going to set a breakpoint and prove that. Cool. So we're at this point. And on click state is really simple. All it's going to do is command bulk edit to launch an action. So let's see where that happens. I'm going to release this, by the way. radio, what was the command? It was bulk edit, I think it's action launch. So when we command bulk edit to launch an action, it calls this function called on bulk edit action launch. Oh no, it looks like on bulk action is just gonna trigger another event. That's kind of crazy. <laughs> so we have to do this again. Yeah, it just triggers another command. That one is on the listings object, and that's going to be action launch. We have a little bit of indirection to handle bulk edit and just listing act actions. That one was action launch. Do, 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 do. Um, does anyone see it here? Yes, that one. Cool. All right. So when an action is launched, it initiates an action controller, and the action controller shows the overlay. So I mean, the Etsy app, this app, has hundreds of view classes, tons and tons of code, more than 10,000 lines of code, but we can quickly jump into anything we want to know and figure out how it works. That's why I'm so excited about the inspector in a nutshell. And, and that's kind of the demos I have. Anyone have any questions? Cool. Yeah, where's the, where's the configuration live for the warnings? Ah, um, where, where does the configuration live for the warnings? Um, right now, it's not a top, yeah. Um, right now, it's just part of the plugin, but we'll expose that down the road. A lot of this inspector is still very, very beta. I added the warnings this weekend because I kind of want to show you guys. I'm glad it worked, <laughs> which is a really good segue 
for taking you behind the scenes on how it works. So one of the things I want to leave you with is this idea that you too can work on inspectors. One of the things I learned while working on this is how accessible everything is. When you're working on an inspector, it's really just a Chrome extension. Um, and our extension, the Marinette inspector, is no different than the other extensions like Elements. The extension is inserted as a web page into an iframe in the Chrome inspector. And because it's a website, and this is where the magic happens, it's just another website that can be inspected. So really, the art of working on an inspector is having three windows open and navigating between them. The app, the inspector, and the inspector inspector. <laughs> I call it app I1 and I2. And if you want to refresh I1, reload it, you refresh I2. Anyways, it's kind of like a hack, but it works. Um, when the inspector opens, it will inject code into the window. I can show you that. So there's the inspector. And this is the app that lives in the Chrome inspector. And really, it's just a Marinette app. It's the simplest thing in the world. There are four sub apps. And it injects the agent and listens to agent events. I'll show you the code if you want. It's dirt simple. This was not hard to build. What was fun to build, I'm not going to say hard, but fun, was the agent. The agent is the script that we inject into the window. And it does all of the black magic that you don't want to do yourself. So the first thing it does is it listens for backbone and Marinette being defined. And once it finds it, and by the way, it should find it before the app starts. Because once it finds these libraries, it monkey patches everything. So we monkey patch like uh, backbone view. We monkey patch uh, trigger. It's evil, but it's good. Because <laughs> we know everything that's going on in the window, and we keep a registry of it. We keep all the class instances, and we keep a record of all the actions that have happened. And we report all that back up to the inspector. Demo time. I'll choose just book. OK, so we've got the Marin inspector. And what I'm going to do is open another inspector. I2. I2 treats I1 just like another website. So I can click on anything in here. And because I have the magnifying glass open, it takes me to those elements. This is not just for the Marinette inspector. This is true for the elements one, too. So I can like click around and see how the inspector works. Right, right? When I started working on the Marinette inspector, I wanted to show an element just like how it looked on the elements tab. So I like, dug through Google for hours to like, see how Chrome did it, and if there's like, a Chrome API for showing an element. And then someone was like, dude, just go to the Elements tab, use the magnifying glass, and get the HTML and the CSS, and you're good. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I can even like, jump to the iframe for the inspector. No, I'm just having fun. I'll show you some cool stuff. Uh, grab the inspector as an app. Grab the UI pane, grab the view, I, view collection, and that's the list of views we're showing in the tree. The view collection, by the way, has all the views, even the ones that were detached. So you can do like crazy things we're not doing already. And that's I2. The cool thing about the inspector is it has this agent object, which is the object that the agent script creates. And because it's exposed on the window, we can call cool methods like serialize view, serialize channel. We can get all the things it knows about. Like for just book, we are listening to 36 views, 13 models, and one collection. We have all that data available in the agent. And that's how the agent works. It just patches the classes, detects new instances, serializes the stuff, and then detects changes on the view, on the model, just everything, and ships a backup. And I think that's the inspector in a nutshell. If you want to get involved, I highly encourage it. It's a lot of fun to work on these tools. If you want to work on your own tool, like maybe a D3 tool or something, I'd be happy to help you get started. So before I finish up, I just want to thank a lot of people and just talk about the team that went into it, because it wasn't just me. 
the Marion Inspector is built on top of the Backbone Debugger. And I've talked a lot with Manuel, who built the debugger, and he's done a fantastic job. And this would not be possible if it weren't for him. We forked the project, we're working on his code, and we're going to contribute back. Etsy has sponsored me to work on this project. I've worked on it for the past two months full time. And I'm really grateful to having an awesome team that's back in this project helping out. Etsy has been a really good sponsor of the project. The inspector is an official Marionette plugin, which means that Marionette Core is back in the project giving a lot of support. And we're working really close with the community to make this better. We built an awesome team for the inspector. Uh, so Christian's here, Ian's here, and many, many more people have come in and helped out. In fact, Ian built that activity pane in the past week. <laughs> so a lot of things are going into it, and it's really, really great. One of the things that I've done a lot is try to encourage not just people to work on it, but the companies that employ these people to give back. So we've all benefited a lot from open source. And we've grown as engineers, and these comp our companies have benefited. I think it's important to connect the circle and encourage companies to give time to their employees to work on open source. And as a project, we are working closely with several companies to set up programs where these tasks can go directly onto the scrum boards of the team so that we can connect the circle and more people are working on these projects. And that brings me to you. We want everyone to work on this tool. The inspector has brought on more than, I want to say 10 contributors, but tons of contributors. And many of them are first time open source contributors. And a lot of that is because we're in the Gitter room next to the Marinette room, and we're talking all the time. We also use Screen Hero, and I'm on Screen Hero about an hour a night. Screen Hero is a remote pairing platform. So we can like share a screen and start working immediately. And if you want to get involved, please do. Lastly, we have a lot of GitHub issues marked as help wanted. So it's very easy to get in and start work on any of these. The typical help wanted issue will have a really detailed overview of what we're looking for with a clear specification so you know what to do, and a patch. So you can apply the patch and start working on it very, very quickly. Like clearly it's not done for you, but you don't have to understand the entire code base to get involved. So I think the inspector makes for a really good project to get involved in, even if you haven't done any open source before. If you like Backbone and like Marionette, this is a really fun project to like understand how the thing works and start adding functionality that hopefully like will improve the tools you use every day. And that brings me to the future. I still believe we're in like the early 20th century building a skyscraper that like could fall down and the tools aren't quite there and we're risking our lives doing it. But it's a lot of fun and it's so exciting to see these tools getting built before our eyes and improving all the time. And I'm really excited about the future. So thank you. <laughs>